Hello, everyone. Welcome to another week of A Sip of Knowledge with Marty Duffy, Liz Rhodes, and Lou Bryson. Plus, this week, special guest, Dr. Pat Heist, who I will let your host give a more formal introduction to in just a moment. Uh, real quick, before I turn things over, which I'm going to try to do quickly because uh, there's such a packed room. Full, I think we've seen almost all 50 states so far. Uh, Ooh, and South um, Africa, Germany. And, and UK. South Africa. Yeah, yeah, point that out. Um, so thank you to everyone who's already here joining, saying hello in the chat. Uh, I see a lot of you have discovered that. Um, also, you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, there's a little button that says ask a question. So if you have any questions for Pat or for your host at any point during the presentation, just press that button and type your question in there. I'll be keeping an eye out for those. Uh, and last but not least, feel free to invite more of your friends to join us. There's a share button at the top that makes that easy. Uh, but with all that said, uh, Marty, Liz, and Lou, I will turn things over to the three of you now. I guess I'll go. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's me. I'm Martin Duffy. I'm a uh, former, for long time, former senior master of whiskey for Diageo back in the day. Then uh, 18 Glorious Months is the national brand ambassador for Benedictine. Benedictine. So, any questions about French liqueurs, just throw them my way. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, eight glorious years as the co-producer of the Chicago Independent Spirit Expo. And for the last six and a half years, I've been representing Glencairn Crystal in North America. Oh, look at that. Yeah. There We're you go. Today. Lizard. Thanks, Marty. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. i um, really excited. We were just discussing before the show. I think this is our largest show. So amazing. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm Liz Rhodes, technical distiller and spirit consultant. Have just over a decade of experience in alcoholic beverage, um, ranging across a couple different substrates and products, including beer, rum, vodka. Um, but my particular expertise and favorite is in whiskey. Go figure. Um, I spent most of my career at a little company called Diageo, but now I'm currently founder and principal at Spirit Safe Consulting. And if you want to learn more about that, in the About the Host section, there's a little link to my website. So give it a little tap. Check it out. Lou? Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm Lou Bryson. I'm a whiskey writer. And I'm was the uh, managing editor of Whiskey Advocate magazine for 20 years and uh, now freelance and promoting my latest book, oh, Whiskey God. Masterclass, Such a... ah, which oh, I, 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 I went down and, and talked to Dr. Pat about some of the stuff that's in here. So, you know, it's, you know, it's good stuff. Uh, I'm also a senior writer for, uh, senior drinks writer for the Daily Beast. And my, uh, in my glass today is the new, uh, Puncher's Chance uh, Bourbon, 90 proof from Kentucky. About to get on to that. Um, back to you, Marty. Well, and I'm actually starting off with a little, uh, this is some Empire Rye from Kings County. A little sound nice. that sent me. Nice. Yeah, sweet. But I actually, I think Lizard, since yeah. she is. We're geek. doing something a little bit different for the whole month of February, as mentioned. We're doing a little technical takeover on ASOC, and um, I'm wearing my back off, man. I'm a scientist, which was a lovely Christmas gift from my co-host, Marty Duffy. <laughs> um, yeah, so for the whole month of February, we're going to be getting a little intimate into the whiskey making process. Um, today, we're actually talking about a very special topic. Um, we'll be talking about a tiny little organism, about 10 microns long, and Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And although it is very tiny, it is really important um, in the whiskey making process because they're the ones actually making alcohol. So really it's our job as distillers to make sure they're well fed, <laughs> that they're happy, <laughs> comfy, maybe serenade them with a little song every now and then. Little yeast zoologist. That's where you are. <laughs> yeah, they, they run the show. We just make right. sure they're happy. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking today about yeast and fermentation. Um, and to do that, we have a very special guest, 
the guy to have this conversation with. Um, he has over 20 years in uh, experience in ethanologenic fermentations. He has a PhD and MS in plant pathology from the University of Kentucky. Um, in 2006, he actually co-founded um, Firm Solutions with uh, his business partner, um, Shane Baker, in which they you know, supply a lot of for fermentation solutions, obviously. So active dried yeast strains. Um, we're discussing bacteria actually is something new into your catalog as well. Um, and have helped countless, I'm sure distilleries kind of really make alcohol both in the, the fuel and beverage side, correct? Yep, that's right. Um, and then in 2012, um, they wanted to take the venture a little bit further and they opened up a wee little shop in, in Danville, Kentucky, which is of course, Wilderness Trail Distillery. Um, and yeah, so not only do they make award-winning whiskeys, um, they were nominated and awarded, um, both Shane and Pat, um, with the Entrepreneur of the Year Award just this past year for their region. Um, which is awesome. So congratulations to that. Um, and really, without further delay, I, I think we should tuck in because as I mentioned, there's a lot of people on the show today and I think we're going to have a lot of questions and get into a lot of technical topics, etc. So without further delay, please welcome me in joining. Clap if you want. We can't hear you, but it's fun. It's fun. It's a sign of one hand clapping. <laughs> <laughs> So please welcome on the show uh, the bearded yeast whisperer himself, Dr. Pat Heist. So, yeah. actually, Thank Pat, you. that's a good question. I mean, it's are you, have you ever checked for yeast in the beard? Uh, no, I know some breweries make beer from yeast that they yeah. culture from their beard. Uh, I don't know if that's very appetizing sounding, but I'm sure that, uh, of all the yeast ridden places that I'm in, uh, you know, very frequently, I'm sure there's. Uh, There's some <laughs> two in there. Awesome. So again, thanks for being on the, <laughs> thanks for being on the show. Um, I, before we get into some of the questions and the technical topics we wanted to discuss, let's first kind of dig into your history a little bit. And if you want to walk us through sort of your background and how you got to where you're at. Sure. So, you know, my passion has been microbiology for over a couple decades. Uh, microbiology was one of the first classes I took in college that really made sense in terms of that. This is what I want to do with my career. And so, you know, everything's all about microbiology. I went on to, as you mentioned, you know, I got a degree in microbiology and then went on to graduate school and to further my microbiology knowledge and got degrees, MS and PhD in plant pathology. So that's studying disease causing organisms, microorganisms in plants. So a lot of the field crops that we use to make uh, bourbon and other whiskeys, uh, you know, I studied those with respect to the type of organisms that, that affect them. Mm -hmm. and then went on to be a medical microbiology professor and uh, during that time uh, started consulting for some companies that uh, you know sold yeast to distilleries or products that control bacterial contamination and um, you know one thing that that i realized very early on is that you know the yeast gets the blame for pretty much every problem that a distillery has so if you're going to be a yeast provider you got to be ready to uh get that phone call hey how come your damn yeast isn't working <laughs> and, and then kind of figure out what's really the problem here you know is it grain quality um are you properly converting starch to fermentable sugars is there bacterial contamination is there a raccoon stuck in the recirculation line? Uh, you know, a lot of different problems can occur. Other Tell me than that's not one that actually happened. Tell me that. Did that happen? Oh, yeah. Oh, my Cell God. phones, brooms, rakes. I've seen them all down in the process. You Glasses. Know. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We had a, a, wow. a middle school student drop their cell phone in our fermenter, oh, wow. uh, one of our 20,000 gallon fermenters here at Wilderness. 
not too awful long ago. And we were able to retrieve it after we dropped the fermenter. And there was about 10 messages from her mom on the phone, which still worked. Did the yeast did the yeast answer back? Did the yeast uh, answer yeah, back? Yeah, for sure. They were they, there was plenty of yeast clogged down into the uh, little microphone thing. <laughs> But anyhow, um, my business partner, Shane Baker, and I, we've been friends for, you know, almost as long as I've been in microbiology. We used to play in a rock band together here in Danville, which is where right. the distillery is located. And uh, when it came time to start Firm Solutions, him and I came together. He's a mechanical engineer, uh, so very, you know, knowledgeable in, you know, process, develop, process design and operations. And then with my microbiology background, we started Firm Solutions back in 2006, and you know we, we per currently do business with about 600 different distilleries and breweries. So we're not just in distilled spirits and fuel alcohol. We're also uh, into a lot of different breweries. So we do beer yeast as well as uh, and a lot of hard seltzer nowadays. Uh, it's kind of something coming on. So uh, we do business about with any anything to do with fermentation, even a lot of the uh, non-alcoholic fermented beverages like kombucha mm -hmm. and kefir and those types of things. Uh, I mean, even we'll get a sauerkraut question every now and then or somebody oh. making cider vinegar or uh, soy sauce. I mean, you just never know what's going on. We, we actually did a job a few years ago where a candy company wanted to know what they could do with their uh, like marshmallow bunnies that didn't make the cut, you know, and so we did a project to determine how much alcohol you can get out of, you know, uh, cold uh, marshmallow bunnies. Wait, so, you know, you never know what's going to happen here at, uh, at Firm Solutions. Nice. So, so we I started Wilderness Trail back in 2012 kind of as an extension of our fermentation business. We do a lot of training for distilleries and breweries. And it just seemed like a, a good thing to have a small distillery here and, you know, to kind of tie into that training. And then we kind of caught the bug. You know, Shane, his family's got some good history in uh, distilled spirits. His grandmother actually retired from Stitzel Weller uh, back oh. in the 90s. And uh, so he's got some family history there. So we started Wilderness Trail in 2012 and in less than eight years have gone from a one barrel a day operation to the 14th largest bourbon producer in the United States. Yeah. And we just became the 18th member of the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Oh, nice. So, Again. I, I didn't a little side business kind of end up getting the best of us. No, what the hell? How did it get that big? Well, you know, if you look at kind of what's been happening over the last 10 years, I mean, a decade and more ago, a lot of the big bourbon producers, if not all of them, were doing a good bit of contract production. For other brands. I mean, if you look at some of these brands that, you know, either have distilleries, but had been sourcing for a while uh, or, you know, brands that don't have distilleries that rely 100 percent on sourcing, mm -hmm. um, you know, those options of uh, contract production from the majors kind of went away and then fell back to companies like MGP, for example. And, you know, and now recently with the labeling requirements, you know, some people don't want to see Indiana on there. Some people don't want to see Tennessee on there. So there was a big opportunity for Kentucky distilleries to, and, you know, if you look at Bardstown Bourbon and, and OZ Tyler, you know, they're well known to do a good bit of contract manufacturing. So when we were kind of looking at, okay, we, we knew we wanted to move beyond a one barrel a day operation, but how we're going to pay for that we got some opportunities to do some pretty large scale contract production that, okay. and we just said, you know what, we need to have this distillery finished in the next six to eight months and just really dug in and got it done and went from, like I said, we went from a one barrel a day operation to like 17 barrels a day to 40 barrels a day. And currently we make 215 to 220 barrels a day, seven days a week. So we're filling a 24,000 barrel warehouse about every hundred days. So wow. you've got, so in being a new distiller, we didn't have any warehouses. So that's kind of the name of the game right now is uh, we've actually just finished. I think we just finished our seventh one and we've got a uh, property across the street that'll accommodate 11 more 24,000 barrel houses, which we'll build over the next three, three and a half years. So Pat, I mean, how'd you, you, you spent about 13 years in university I mean, with a, 
a BS, uh, an MS, and a PhD, getting into microbiology and plant uh, uh, pathology. I mean, what drove you to get into all that? I mean, what's, I mean, I didn't even know there's plant pathology. Yep. So, okay. Yep. I mean, man, I tell you what, I, and I do a lot of, you know, outreach and, and talk to college students about career development and, and things. And I can for sure say that I was probably one of the most confused individuals in the class <laughs> as an undergrad. You know, I, I really didn't even intend on going to graduate school. I took a summer job doing pesticide applications for uh, the Department of Plant Pathology at UK. And, um, you know, they actually called me Spray Boy back then. I was doing, uh, you know, spraying like fungicides on turf grasses and tobacco and dogwood trees and all this stuff. And, and throughout that summer, a couple of the professors, I guess, just recognized, you know, hey, man, this guy's got a good skill set. And they just flat out asked me, do you want to be a, a graduate student in our department? So I was like, well, what does that mean? And they're, it basically equated to where I was going to get a raise over what my spray boy job was. <laughs> and they paid my tuition. So uh, and gave me a laptop. I was like, damn, man, this sounds like a great deal. <laughs> so uh, I got my master's degree and then I'm kind of like. Uh, you know, kind of like Red in Shawshank Redemption, you know, whenever he was getting ready to hang himself in the apartment because he didn't know what to do as a <laughs> civilian. So uh, I was like, man, I'm going to hang on and, and get my Ph.D. That'll give me a few more years to think about it. And then, you know, out of uh, graduate school, I took a job as a medical micro professor at the uh, Kentucky School of Osteopathic Medicine in eastern Kentucky. It's in Pikeville, Kentucky. And, and did that for a while. And so from plant pathology to medical microbiology, it just seemed like the next logical steps to get into a distilled spirits uh, production. So Red, that makes sense. you were like just uh, about identifying opportunities, really. You were uh, get uh, busy living or get busy spraying, I guess. That's right. right. Yeah, huh? that's right. <laughs> hey, by the way, nice we, quote move, there. we move <laughs> further. Steve Basher at uh, Mount Vernon said a cell phone dropped into his fermenter out there and the phone still worked and it Must was be something about that uh, fermentation environment that uh good for cell phones and he said the cell phone was actually 16 percent alcohol afterwards <laughs> <laughs> nice that's a much smaller fermenter of course yes <laughs> right reach down in there and get it the <laughs> <laughs> lizard yeah Lou, did you have a couple more questions? No, I was really, I mean, because, you know, I was not, I really didn't know what to expect when I came down to visit you that time. And I walked in and there was a, a column still that looked like you could stick a nozzle on the end of it and shoot it to the moon. It was, it was huge. And here you guys are just pumping out the spirit. I was, I was shocked at how big the place was. But, yeah, we were on the same size column as Maker's Mark. Now they got three of them. Right, and, we got them. Yeah, but, <laughs> and Pat, I mean, you, they got along on one for a long time. You guys have expanded recently, have you not? Uh, our last expansion was completed in 2018, so that's what took us up to our current capacity, which is about you know if we're if we run on you know considering shutdowns and everything, we can do about 75,000 barrels a year here. Which is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah. Uh, you do have a question from Graham Frazier. Can you talk about the use of wash enzymes and if that has any impact on later fermentation? Wow, we're jumping right in. Yeah. Did we want to? Oh, well, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. This is the first time I've ever heard the term wash enzymes. Uh, so Ooh. if anybody wants to enlighten me beyond uh, just regular enzymes, I mean, we've got enzymes that occur in the malted grains that we use. So, you know, most bourbons have a small bit of uh, malted barley in there. Our bottling bond bourbons have 12% malted barley. And then we also, as a, you know, we are purveyors of enzymes in addition to yeast and antibacterials. Uh, you know, we also market commercial enzymes and we add those to our process as well. So alpha amylase in the cook process, which helps convert starch into dextrins and also is very important for viscosity reduction, especially for running like rye, high rye recipes that can get very viscous. 
um, you add those alpha amylase enzymes in there, not only for breaking starch down, but to help with the viscosity and, and get that material turning. And then we do a glucoamylase, which continues that conversion process from dextrins to fermentable sugars like glucose, maltose, maltotriose. And, uh, you know, those are the main enzymes that, I mean, over on the fuel yeah. alcohol side, there's, there's proteases and down in Florida where they make alcohol out of the orange juice production leftovers, they use pectinases. So uh, we're pretty versed on, you know, what enzymes are used. We're, we're working with some, uh, some uh, dairy people now who are, we've helped to convert some like yogurt whey and cheese whey, which contains lactose, which lactose is a disaccharide composed of a glucose connected to a galactose. And if you use a lactase enzyme, you can break those apart and then yeast can ferment the glucose. So, and there's actually yeast strains like Cluvaramyces, for example, that we can use that not only convert lactose into its base sugars, but can also ferment those sugars to make alcohol. Wow. I think, yeah, just rolling back to the, the question as well, like certainly during the beginning of fermentation, specifically with how your, um, your amylopicosidase and how you're adding that in terms of a simultaneous sacrification and fermentation, especially in higher gravity ferments where you want to control the release of glucose, that certainly could affect, you know, the beginning of fermentation and, and yeast health with that controlling that osmotic stress. Um, so certainly I think there's right a way to, um, you know, manipulate your, your wash enzymes, you know, to affect how fermentation is going to perform. Um, what the, uh, how, how common is the use of uh, enzymes in fermentation in the, in the bourbon industry? Uh, I would say very common. Yeah. I okay. mean, a lot of people won't admit to it. Um, and, and again, it kind of gets back to the purity of it all. And, you know, there's, there's different ingredients that are added. There's nutrients that can be added to, you know, increase the speed of fermentation. Um, you know, when you look at, especially on a very large scale, uh, you know, our 20,000 gallon fermenters, which make, you know, about 60 barrels of bourbon each, you're only looking at just a small bit of enzymes. It's, it's, you know, when you look at the volume of fermentation, you're adding a liter of enzymes. It's really not that significant. If you look at, I mean, our 20,000 gallon fermenters, you they have a liter for the 20,000 gallon fermenter. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't take much Holy at all. Shit. Yeah. Sorry. It, they're very concentrated. Yeah. So if you look at, you know, if you're like grossed out by adding a liter of something to it, you got to got to consider in a 20,000 gallon <laughs> fermenter that's got 42,000 pounds of grain, there's probably 10 bucket loads of dirt going in there <laughs> with the grain, you know, unless you're going to polish every corn kernel off that, that makes it in there. So, you know, there, there's really nothing. I, I don't think any reason to be concerned about using enzymes. Yeah, great. <laughs> It increases yield, you know, the amount of the number of proof gallons of alcohol that we make per bushel of grain. And it also allows us to have the option of speeding up fermentation. So if we want to turn and burn fermenters, uh, which, you know, if we're in a serious, you know, production mode, we can turn a fermenter in as little as 38 hours using oh, yeah. enzymes as well as other techniques like yeast propagation, temperature manipulation, uh, use use of nutrients of, of various kinds. Um, so there's, you know, that's kind of what our job is with our customers is help them to achieve their goals. I mean, we got fuel alcohol customers that are hitting 18, 20% ABV and they're doing that within uh, 45 hours. So, you know, we're talking, you know, we set our fermenters at like 18 bricks, which if you're a gravity person, that'd be like 1.073 something specific gravity. We've got fuel alcohol customers that are, you know, running 28 to 32 bricks. So, uh, you know, big difference in what distilled spirits producers do compared to fuel alcohol producers. And then you get over into the beer world and there's all kinds of other different questions and and attributes of the yeast they're looking at. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> I got 16 <laughs> hours more no, than no, I mean, <laughs> You guys stayed in the obvious. It was funny. Um, hey, Pat, the, uh, you know, with yeast, the importance of it, when 
historically, Liz, this uh, goes to you too. I mean, do you guys know when exactly did distillers understand uh, that it was more than just a component in distilling, that it was, you know, the importance of it? You know what I mean? Uh, when, when did, you know, there's a lot, especially in Kentucky, there's such a big focus on yeast, whereas in other parts of the world, they're only kind of now getting into uh, focusing more on it as opposed to the grain. Yeah. So what? when did all that really start happening? Do you guys have any idea? Like, I actually think a lot of people do still think it's just an ingredient you add. <laughs> really? Yeah. They, they yeah. don't have the, the focus on it I mean, because it seems. It, it depends on, right. It depends on the distillery. It depends on who you ask, um, you know. Especially if you go to Kentucky, you go there and everyone, it's almost bragging rights. A lot of people talk about their, uh, their, uh, their yeast. This is, you know, ours and this is just for us. And we, oh, yeah. Well, I can say I can say with a good bit of certainty that we supply several uh, people's great grandparents' yeast to them. Um, you know, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> did you help uh, Stephen Beam? Did Steve mention that? Did you? Yeah, help that's him? actually. Uh, I've actually got an article sitting here on my desk somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Calgary in the Bourbon Country Reader. Uh, he published it so I can talk about it. And, and you know, I think Steve Beam and those guys, uh, they, they talk about it pretty openly. He was on the show and mentioned it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, what, what we did for them and what we've done for a lot of other people is they actually brought their family yeast jug to us, which they went to the Oscar Getz Museum over there in Bardstown, oh which would be nice just to go into a museum and be like, hey, can I borrow my, uh, you know, ancestors <laughs> yeast jug there for a few weeks? That's so what so they brought that into us with, you know, hey, can you guys culture the yeast out of here that would have been in there? And, you know, like most microorganisms, if you're sitting in a dry container for over 100 years, you're probably not going to be alive. But what we were able to do is get residues out of there and extract DNA and mm -hmm. then amplify that DNA and sequence that DNA. And then we matched up to uh, strains that we had in our library. So, you know, that's, we do a good bit of that uh, for people and have been, it's not always successful. You have to have a significant amount of residues. A lot of those old antique, uh, I mean, Dave Shurick from uh, Woodford Reserve or formerly of Woodford. Now he's uh, Boondocks uh, whiskey. He brought in a yeast jug that he bought at an antique store that somebody made a lamp out of. And unfortunately in that situation, there wasn't anything in there to get. They cleaned it out really good. So um, if you can find residue and get DNA, then you can wow. uh, sort of reverse engineer that yeast without culturing a living yeast out there. That's so that was, yeah, that was something I wanted to dig into a, a little bit um, in terms of, right, you've, say you've acquired, right, a lot of yeast over the years. Um, I think we were chatting before the show and you mentioned how, how many We've got over 9,000 different yeasts. Right. So a few, right? <laughs> which are which are dwarfed by the number of the other thing you're calling bacteria, right? Yeah, we've got estimated about 65,000 bacteria that we've isolated from distilleries all over the world. Where do you keep all that? Well, well each really small, one Marty. would be in a small uh, <laughs> cryogenic vial. Yeah. We've got about two pretty large freezers packed full of them, and then we keep a copy off-site as well with those organisms. You know, I mean, even even if I gave you a little bead and said, hey, it's a little, look how small it is, but I gave you 60,000 of them, that's a lot of beads. Yeah, okay, so they'll fit in a cheese ball container. Deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and you got to consider that, you know, even if you look at active dried yeast, like what you would buy at the store to make bread or pizza dough, there's an estimated 20 to 30 billion cells per gram in that. So a little bit, a little dab will do you, you could say. <laughs> you not listening to me earlier, Marty, when I said less than 10 microns? <laughs> oh, like yeah, 10 <laughs> microns. I have 10 microns of, yeah, I don't know what a 10 micron is. What do they look like? Do you remember what I said? It's really, really small. Yeah, see, yeah. that's what you need to say. 
that's uh, that's what I understand. One thousand <laughs> <a> millimeter. <laughs> So that's something, just just digging back into that a little bit, um, can you talk a little bit about some of the places that you have isolated and found these different cultures um, and also translating that back to the specific cultures that you use at Wilderness Trail and sort of how, you know, how you found them, how you isolated yeah. them and why you have chosen them for your whiskey. Yeah. So when we first started Firm Solutions, we didn't have any yeast strains. So, you know, one thing that we want to do is just simply go out to the marketplace and you'll see what what yeast strains were selling on the market in terms of beer strains. And I mean, you, you get into beer strains and you've got you've got, um, you know, lager and Pilsner and Hefeweizen and Saison and all these other you know Belgian strains. So those are readily available out there to buy. And then if you have a laboratory, you can kind of, you know, using genetics or other techniques. Um, sometimes we just do fermentations in the lab mm -hmm. to see, you know, if it's going to make a good beer or if it's going to be appropriate for distilled spirits. So, um, you know, that's one way to get yeast strains. I mean, natural organisms, if you can get your hands on them, you know, it's not like getting the recipe to Coca-Cola, which is probably, you know, in some vault somewhere. Right. Um, you know, if you can get your hands on yeast strain, then you're, if you can get your hands on it legally and, and you know we work with a lot of people who don't want don't want their yeast strain stolen and so in those cases you know we're going to sign material transfer agreements agreeing you know we're not going to take oh. your strain or whatever but if you know i can go in on a distillery tour and come out with a yeast strain pretty easy you know I mean, <laughs> get a little bit too close to that fermentation <laughs> oh, man, the beer's got a little bit of mash on it what do you know Let me just take a little bit of off, take it to the lab uh got yeast dip the that. beard in the yeast uh, a little that's right have that's you right. do you ever have you come across actual people coming to you and with maybe a competitor um and you know in terms of beer maybe and and saying can you genetically test this? I think so and so is stolen. Um, we do a little bit of that. Uh, it's not the majority at all of what we do, but we do we do a little bit of that. Um, and again, you know, there's really no such thing as stealing a uh, a living organism if you can get your hands on it. Uh, but you know, you can go to the store and buy some, you know, buy some cantaloupe and some cherries and some strawberries and some plums and grapes. And get, and get all kinds of different yeast strains, but then you have to kind of evaluate them. Is it the yeast? Is it the, you know, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the genus and species of the yeast that you're looking for? Um, you know, does it, does it use up all the sugar, which is what we want in distilled spirits mm -hmm. production? You know, a lot of beer strains, if you look at what's considered attenuation, does it leave a little sugar behind? Because if you're drinking the end product of fermentation, you might want a little bit of that sweetness left behind. In distilled spirits production, if you're buying grain, but you're not making alcohol out of it, that's just going out the door with the cow feed. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things right. to consider. Temperature tolerance. Uh, you know, look at some of these lager strains uh, of beer. They're, they're fermenting down at 30, 40, 50 degrees, whereas we're targeting, you know, more in the 75 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit range. And that's it to that point. I mean, Saccharomyces cerevisiae diastaticus is considered an actual contaminant in, in versus that's we want that right like every every bit of, of glucose released and consumed so yep well now speaking of diastaticus we've actually used that so we also do genetic engineering for like fuel alcohol distilleries that use a lot of uh you know millions of dollars worth of enzymes every year so diastaticus mm -hmm. actually has a glucoamylase gene mm -hmm. that we've that we've actually taken out of diastaticus and put it into saccharomyces cerevisiae non-diastaticus um and and we can genetically engineer yeast to produce okay. those enzymes that those customers are pay, paying millions of dollars for so it's oh, kind of yeah. a little two for one uh type of thing with all these big words it probably uh isn't a good idea to have a stutter if you were a uh, big uh, <laughs> be, 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 that'd be really tough. Yeah, yeah. My first name is Elmer, but uh, I don't know <laughs> Thank God. Uh, hey, you know, so 
the different since there's these different yeast strains and a lot of natural yeast right in the air and like you said it's on fruit and everything else um i have you collected yeast from around the country every state maybe specific regions and see what and does can yeast uh thrive in every kind of climate or is like kentucky a really good because the humidity maybe i don't know uh, there's yeast about anywhere you go. I mean, you don't have to look much further than the substrates that are used to make ethanol. That's why I was mentioning the fruits earlier. You know, that's probably, you know, some of the oldest examples of alcoholic beverage production would probably be wine or something like, or maybe even beer. But, you know, back in the early days, I mean, before the microscope was invented, uh, which I think was in the 1600s, uh, you know, people didn't understand, people didn't, microorganisms weren't even known Thanks. so yeah. so you know you, you mash up a bunch of grapes and you, you just let it go and either the bacteria are going to take hold and make a bunch of acid or mm -hmm. you're going to have the yeast take hold and make a bunch of alcohol so over time people kind of figure it out and then you can sterilize your substrate and then add in the yeast that you, the desired yeast which is what everybody does these days not everybody but most people yeah. The smart ones. Yep. That's what I'd say. <laughs> uh, hey, old man uh, Bay says he was just at the Neely's family distillery. They were talking about how they captured yeast in the wild. Do you yep. know that, Dr. Pat, yourself? Yeah. Yeah, Where? we've helped several distilleries uh, to, I mean, basically, you just take a, sub, a sterile substrate out to, like a corn mash, let's say, out to your whatever location you're trying to capture yeast, open the lid and let, you know, let mother nature get yeah. into there. And you're hoping that, you know, you're going to get a yeast. Now I will say that we've been involved in several projects to where I, you know, we're working with a customer, let's say that did that. And they're wanting to know, you know, how did they capture that or whatever? My first question is like, did you, did you sterilize the substrate first of all because you could take and make corn mash and put it in a sterile chamber and and yeast will kind of grow in there if there's anything left alive uh and, and you know mash is something that requires a great deal of heat and pressure if you're going to kill out everything in there if you leave behind one living yeast you take that substrate out to your environment of choice and you're trying to capture yeast you open the lid and then whatever was already in there starts growing. You really didn't capture anything. You just kind of, so, so my, my uh, advice for those type of people would be take your substrate from wherever you made it at in a lab, in a kitchen and take half of it to where outside where you're trying to catch the yeast, take the other half and leave it behind and see if you kind of evolve a yeast in there and then that'll tell you whether or not your substrate was already contaminated. There's a lot of dynamics. Whole thing with yeast. Do you do this, Liz? Do you go around chasing yeast? Um, I, I did a little bit of that um, at my previous employer, <laughs> actually. Um, I wish you guys had little yeast nets. I'd like to see you guys just running through a field trying to catch yeast in a net as opposed to you know the yeast coming to you. I guess this is my romantic image of yeast catching. I think you got a weird idea of romance. Marty. Ooh, dang. <laughs> you, should read my, romance. you should read my poetry, Lou. We <laughs> get romance. Um, <laughs> Huston. Hey, she says, I feel like I'm on a date. <laughs> With who, Monique? With who? Which one? Why? Which one? <laughs> The yeast? I don't know. Well, yeast. That would be my guess. There yeah. you go. Um, so something else I wanted to kind of talk about um, in terms of, because I think it seems like you've obviously carefully crafted your different process procedures um, at Wilderness Trail for a plethora of different reasons um, in terms of either right, yield or optimization, um, flavor, et cetera. Uh, so one thing I wanted to kind of touch on is, um, you know, sour mash versus sweet mash. Um, certainly there's a lot of different ways you can achieve a sour mash um, process. And we talked about it a little bit before the show. Um, you know, for example, 
actually doing uh, inoculating uh, the fermentation with lactic acid bacteria. Um, but probably the most common um, one is, I think in the bourbon industry, um, is actually using stillage, thin stillage, and adding that as back set, either in the mashing process, because um, we talked about, right, enzymes being pretty important, so creating an optimal pH for that process, or optimizing the pH for the start of fermentation. Um, there's also some other right added benefits um, for yeast health, so recycling unsaturated fatty acids, for example, B vitamins, um, all sorts of stuff, water savings. But with all that said, you have actually chosen to go the, the sweet mash route. So I was wanting, um, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and, and why you kind of landed on that. Yeah. So to kind of preface my conversation here, you know, we're, we're not of the position that sweet mash is better than sour mash in any uh, stretch of the imagination. I mean, it's well known. Most of the, the most popular brands in the world are made using the sour mash process. And for the listeners out there, uh, you know, the sour mash process is kind of like making sourdough bread. You're, you're starting with a little piece of your previous batch. And so sour mashing in the mashing process where you're adding the milled grains to the hot water, you're adding a little bit of, of the leftovers from a previous distillation back to the front in your mashing process. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's for consistency. Well, the reason that we don't do that is because if you look at all the different components that go into a mash, the grain, the water, the yeast, those things can be kept pretty consistent on a batch to batch, year to year basis. But one thing we know, and this is from having experience in over a thousand different distilleries, back set is not very consistent, even in definitely between distilleries, but also even in the same distillery. So we, we do sweet mash to actually remain consistent. Now, why do other distilleries say they use sour mash to be consistent? I think what they really mean, some people believe that the sour mash actually contributes a significant amount of yeast. That back set came off the bottom of that still. If you're using a column still at 213, 215 degrees and probably set in a tank, at, at that temperature or not much lower. So there's not a significant amount of yeast at all alive in back set. There's a little bit, but not really enough to where that's going to be your only source of yeast. So you're going to add yeast anyway in the front end. Now, sour mash producers, when they say it makes it more consistent, I think what they really are referring to is the back set is acidic. And when you add that to the mash, it reduces the pH of the mash and when you reduce the pH of the mash, making it more acidic, you're less susceptible to contamination by a broad scope of microorganisms, yeast, lactic acid bacteria. Mm -hmm. So I think when they're saying it's more consistent, they mean it reduces the chances that it's going to go right. south on them from contamination. And then beyond that, stillage is a total pain in the ass to get rid of. And we, we generate mm -hmm. 100,000 gallons of stillage at our distillery seven days a week. So that's, you know, 13 to 15 truckloads of that. We got to manage. We give that away to local cattle farmers to feed. So you got to get rid of it anyway. So it makes sense to incorporate some back into the process. And then lastly, um, you're recovering that heat. So, you know, if your mashing process is high heat and, you know, 20 to 30 percent of your water is 215 degree back set, then you're also heat recovery is a big part of that. Now, what we did is our tanks that hold our stillage, we put coils in there that we run cold water through. So our, our stillage tanks act as hot water heaters. So we get free hot water heater just by having coils. And that's that's fairly common at distillers. Yeah, yeah. So that's the way we, we recover that heat rather than put that hot back set into our process. And so on the subject of bacterial contamination, if sour mash producers are trying to mitigate contamination by doing that, well, we're firm solutions. That's our job is we help distilleries uh, mitigate bacterial contamination. I mean, that's what the advice we're giving every day, all day. And so we're able to devise other methods around cleaning and sanitation to reduce contamination rather than rely on acidifying our mash. Awesome. awesome. 
Gotcha. So we, I think, probably should move to some of the comments and questions. Lots of questions. Because um, we've got a lot of them coming through. Um, so let's skip up. Um, Oh, well, there's so many. I'm I'm trying to find the first one. <laughs> well, there's something to point out. So those wash enzymes, that was from Graham Frazier. He's coming from Scotland. So that's a Scottish. Oh, uh, the wash thing, right? Mm -hmm. The Scots, they have a new. Very hygienic. They have Washing a lot of different the words. They have different words for everything. Um, a comment from Steve Bayshore. Uh said Washington purchased yeast for his rye whiskey from a brewer in the 1790s. Well, of course he would have. I mean, I, I know they're using yeast, but I, whether, I, like I said, whether it was just another ingredient, a component, they nowadays there seems to be a lot more focus and a lot more. I mean, obviously, what Pat's doing is uh, is is taking it to a whole different level, right? Yeah, I saw a question pop up here again. It was Steve Bashore, and he was asking about what's the earliest yeast strains that we've isolated. Um, there was actually one, um, a particular yeast strain that we isolated from a really old distillery here in Kentucky. I won't say which one, but uh, it's an old one that was recently revived. And we went in there and we're cutting the, cutting the pipes apart and trying to isolate yeast. And we found an interesting strain that really wasn't um, a necessarily a good strain for making alcohol mm -hmm. but whenever we did you know looked it up and and, and uh, identified it the only other time that particular yeast had ever been described was from like a polar ice cap sample so it was like isolated out of the ice on you know i don't know if it was antarctica or, or whatever but you know that's probably a, an example and a lot of the yeast strains that we i that we find there's not a there's not a match so there are yeast strains that have yet to be have yet to be characterized. So there's a lot of uh, yeah, there's only about fifteen hundred species, I think, of yeast that have been maybe it's eighteen hundred now, but you know, experts estimate that's less than uh one percent of all the yeast that have yet to be discovered out there. Well, you got a job cut out for you. <laughs> and you work you mentioned you also work with non ethymogenic strains as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So like for kombucha production, you want to have those organic acids like acetic acid, for example, um, but you don't want the alcohol. Some some companies do want the alcohol if you're making like a hard kombucha. Mm -hmm. But if you're uh, you know advertising it as a non-alcoholic beverage, you don't want it to have alcohol. in it. So our next question comes from Ralph. Uh, how do you and Shane decide upon the current mash bill that you utilize? Also, do you have any imminent plans to commercially expand on different mash bills similar to the way other competitors may be doing. Personally, I love what you're doing. And my number of bottles seems to be growing up pretty regularly. Nice. So, you know, we came up on the mash bills that we, I mean, kind of like how we advise our customers, you know, a good place to start, you know, what, what kind of whiskey am I going to make? First question is what kind of whiskey do you like? And then we can kind of reverse go from there. I had mentioned before that Shane's family uh, has a history in the bourbon, uh, in bourbon production, going back to Stitzel Weller and even before that at Kentucky River Distilling, um, which was the EJ Curley Distillery. And, um, you know, some really old brands. Um, I can't right off the top of my head. I know that eventually became like old Fitzgerald, Pappy Van Winkle, Weller, and these type of things, which a lot of those are weeded bourbons. So we, when we started Wilderness Trail, we knew that we wanted to purchase local grains and they don't grow a lot of rye here in Kentucky. And it actually took us a year after we started our distillery to link up with a local farm that was able to grow a very specific rye variety that does grow well here in Kentucky. So to start with, we wanted to do weed at bourbons and we just kind of looked at some of the archives from the Stitzel Weller distillery and what mash bills they were using back then, which is a little lower corn than what you normally see. So our we did actually our two bourbons are identical recipes except one's got wheat and one's got rye so they are 64 percent corn 24 percent wheat or rye and then 12 percent malted barley and for anyone who has a bottle of wilderness trail if you look on the side of the bottle we list our uh, mash recipe 
in any of the barrel picks, we actually will list the yeast strain that we use. And all the strains that we use to make our whiskeys are available. You can get on Firm Solutions website right now and order the yeast that we're using to make our whiskeys. So we're uber transparent. I mean, we want people to make, somebody wants to make what kind of whiskey we make, we'll teach them how to do it. Wow. Yeah. Very convenient. Hey, uh, by the way, Steve Basher, uh, Basher uh, also says, how many microns will fill a Glencairn glass? Steve, a lot. <laughs> yeah, because they're really, really small. They, according to Lou, they're... In, yeah, are we, are we talking a uh, normal size or are we talking the mini... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> We're talking this one here. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um... Marty, you have some questions that were submitted from Colin. Oh, <laughs> you want to go, go to Colin Blake's corner? Yeah, let's kick yeah. over the walls. There's a new segment that we're going to start. Uh, <laughs> that will probably only last Colin this Blake week. Segment. Colin's <laughs> corner. Colin Blake from uh, Moonshine University sent some uh, penetrating questions, probing, I should say. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, at what point will you reach maximum goatee? Um, yeah, I'm not there yet. I'll just tell you, uh, you know, uh, back in the old days when I was called spray boy, as I was mentioning to you, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the hair was actually wasn't here. It was in the back. Uh, I used to have a pretty massive mullet. Um, I don't know which, which style it was, but maybe it was the, uh, I don't know if it was the Kentucky waterfall or, or what. <laughs> But my hair has always oh, been like this on the top. But about 20 years ago, it was at least this long in the back. See, it didn't have any gray idea. in it, but uh, I had a massive mullet for a while. Wow. Oh, wow. my God, Liz. <laughs> what are you, uh, trying to challenge Crystal Gale over there? I mean, it's <laughs> probably the longest it's been, and it's because I refuse to get a haircut right now. <laughs> nice. Morticia, Morticia Adams. Is not it yet? Pat, you should grow the hair, bring the mullet back, and then it'll well, just look just good. balance. Around. <laughs> I've tried a few times, and my mother and other people that love me uh, always remind me once it gets, you know, about this long, hey, man, don't do that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I remember uh, when I made the decision. I mean, I had a mullet going back before Billy Ray Cyrus even came out with Achy Breaky Heart. And the fact that, that he's from here in Kentucky, he could have very well seen me somewhere somewhere <laughs> early on and was like, man, I want my hair just like his. So uh, I remember when I made the decision to cut it off, and it was about the time that like mulletlover.com where they'd catch somebody with a mullet and they'd put it online. Mm. Or definitely when Joe Dirt came out, I was like, man, I got to make a break. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. The business in the front, party in the back. That's, that's right. So I just got the party in the front now. Yeah, that's that's a better way. It's a good, it's a good look. Though you do look uh, like you should be part of ZZ Top. Oh yeah, I get that a lot. All right, uh, another uh, question, another piercing question from Colin. How has Slayer influenced your professional life and choices? This is the band Slayer, folks. That's right. So anybody that knows me knows Slayer is my favorite band. I actually took uh, my daughter. My kids went and saw them with me like four times on this last tour, which was their last one. And for a band to be in business for 40-something years and pick November of 2019 to call it the quits, I mean, what perfect timing wow. to do that, you know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, man, I'm a huge Slayer fan and, and almost any chance I get to talk about him, I, I really, actually my, my youngest daughter, the last time we saw him, which was in Louisville, Kentucky, they actually stayed at our hotel and we got to meet him in the lobby oh. and my daughter literally like we walked in and there Slayer standing there and I walked right past him like, holy shit, I'm not <laughs> speaking in front of thousands of people. But when it came time to meet Slayer, man, I was uh -huh. like, ah. so my daughter was like, Dad, we gotta go. Get you. We gotta go talk to him. And I was like, "All right, all right." Yeah. Why don't you? Why don't you do one of those whiskeys like Paul Helco did with the flaming lips? You could do one with Slayer. A well, special bring edition. him my way, and uh, and be happy to do it. <laughs> talk to Fred Minnick. He is the. Uh, he's yeah, the, right. Well, he's Slayer's a, one of the one of the bands that just happens not to be in his list. So. Uh, <laughs> I think he's afraid of them. Fred, you know, Fred's a little skittish around. Long-haired people. No, he um, just had uh, Scott Ian from Anthrax on his show. So oh, that's, that's there you go. Metal. Yeah, that, that was one of the big four, Anthrax. 
He's opening up. He's opening up. Uh, another one. How many shiitake logs do you own? Uh, probably five or six hundred. I've been growing oh, shiitake hey. mushrooms for uh, uh, probably as long as I've been in the alcohol business. That was one of my first entrepreneurial uh, things. I was going to grow shiitake logs off of all the trees that they clear cut from strip mining operations over in eastern Kentucky. I did a lot of community education seminars, and there are a lot of people in eastern Kentucky that are still growing shiitake mushrooms to this day because of the technology that I brought to the uh, the wow. area. Look at you, a shiitake hero, or a hero mm -hmm. yep. shiitake growers. Instead and of a jukebox I hero, I'm a shiitake <laughs> hero. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you talk shiitake. Um, That's, pretty That's pretty cool. The, and his last question is, what do you have fermenting at home? Uh, well, this is another thing. Anybody that knows me, you know, I'm not going to throw away fruit when it starts to go bad. I'm going to put it in a bowl, <laughs> chop it up, and see what grows in it, and then bring it to the lab. So i probably got a couple bowls of different things fermenting, but I'm a pretty uh, regular producer of uh, kombucha. And i got several different scobies. Uh, that I use SCOBY, S-C-O-B-Y, Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast is what that stands for. But if anybody's ever made that, um, it's basically you take like sweet iced tea and then you put that uh, SCOBY in there and, it, and then different bacteria and yeast uh, inoculate the tea, ferment it, and makes a very tasty, uh, very healthy drink. So I got some kombucha ferment at home. Pat, Pat are you married? Um, I'm let's say about half and half, <laughs> halfway out and, and halfway in. <laughs> there might be, I there might be a reason with all the stuff I was, growing. I have to admit, I was wondering what your house smoked like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm the only one that lives in, in people, the house but... I'm in now, so I've got free reign over the uh, fermentation. <laughs> on. Right. I think I saw an episode in the Creep Show with uh, Stephen King. That I've, I'm picturing right now, where he just had uh, a moss grow all over him. Eventually, yeah. that's what yeah. I'm kind of picturing your house. That's right. Uh, we, uh, so we've got, we uh, we yeah, we've got quite a few questions. So, yeah, yeah. a question from also Graham Fraser. So, Scotch whiskey distilleries use mainly proprietary distillers and or brewers' yeast, plus occasionally wine yeast. How do the multiple yeast strains used by bourbon distillers develop flavors further? And this is actually a question um, I had for you in terms of the active dried yeast strains that you have in um, particular with uh, PAD1, so POF positive yeast strains, mm. and, which are very critical for rye whiskey production to get that nice four vinyl glycol spicy profile. So do you want to touch on that? Well, um, you know, we got all kinds of different people doing different things. I mean, these days, you know, if, if you look at most beer strains, the reason they're not appropriate to make distilled spirits is because they don't finish off all the sugar. But they do produce some really interesting organic acids and esters. And so we've got a lot of people experimenting with, hey, let's put a beer strain in there to get a little bit of, you know, those flavor components going. And then let's throw a distiller strain in on day two or mix and match strains. I mean, we've got a lot of customers of ours that, you know, I'd mentioned earlier, we have 9,000 different yeast strains, but we only market about 25 of those to, you know, about half of that 25 to beer producers and the other half to distilled spirits or fuel alcohol producers. So there's all kinds of really interesting, very creative things that are going on with uh, different yeast as well as incorporating uh, bacteria. Well, Pat, you know, when you mentioned before that you found some yeast in the pipes of uh, a, a closed distillery, I'm thinking, well, you know, so many distilleries are very open. You'll see doors and windows are open and yeast is in the air. So uh, what, what would happen if, say, you're using your distiller's yeast for the fermentation, but there's yeast in those pipes that just got in there naturally. You know, does that alter? I mean, does how does that come into play or does it not at that point, especially if it's already alcohol? Is it already killing? Well, it? in an operational distillery or brewery, you should be keeping your pipes and tanks very clean. So 
if, if a wild yeast just had, you know, a lot of the bourbon distilleries, including ours here in Kentucky, there we have open top fermenters. You would never do that making beer. So there's our group. There's going to be stuff landing in there. Yeah. But, you know, including uh, tourists come sticking their finger in the, in the mash. But if you consider the fact that we've got 200 million yeast cells per milliliter, you know, for every this much mash, we've got two, 150 to 200 million very vigorous yeast cells. A couple little organisms landing in there would be like a couple people showing up to the Battle of the Orcs in, yeah, you know, the uh, <laughs> Lord of the Rings. The heck that show is Lord of the Rings. There yeah. Was? yeah. I was there. I went to one of the of the orcs. Okay. They didn't even see me. There were so many orcs. And I made no difference in the battle. Next, next question from John Hayes. If you propagate your own yeast, how long can you continue before the yeast? Oh, yeah. I wanted to hear that one. Off from the yeah. So in beer production, where you're fermenting a clear wort, the yeast sink to the bottom. You can easily recover those yeast and reuse them. The other thing about beer production is typically the strains cost a lot more to make because they're not as vigorous as what we use for distilled spirits. So, you know, some beer strains could cost $100 a pound. And so recycling it, there's actually a monetary value with that. Um, distilled spirits production, especially like bourbon whiskey, which you're fermenting on a whole mash, which has all the grains still in there, you can't really, that the yeast won't settle out. So you can, you can, you know, let's say you drop your fermenter down to 10% to still off the 90% you took out, then fill fresh mash on top of it and allow that yeast from the previous batch to, you know, do its job. That works. But what you got to watch out for is every time that you, every passage of that yeast to a new fermenter, first of all, you may not have had opportunity to clean the tank that it came out of. Second of all, any contamination that would have built up, you're starting with higher levels of contamination oh, each successive time. So, and distiller strains, depending on what volume of yeast that you're purchasing, most of those range between $4 to $10 a pound. So if I'm trying to save $50 and I screw myself out of 10 barrels of whiskey, it, the economics really don't work out. I mean, yeast is a very cheap part of all the ingredients that go into that. And you just got to consider what's my gain here. Am I going to try to save $8, you know, and, and put 60 barrels of bourbon at risk. So, you know, just different mentality of how you think about things. But I mean, if you keep, if, if it's conceivable that you could keep everything very clean. And if you could, I mean, you could keep passing the yeast on forever, but in our experience, places that do that, they run into problems after about four or five batches if they even get that far. Awesome. Then uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron Hardiman, any methods to capture yeast that is more alcohol tolerant in the wild? Add some spirits to the collection mash? So whenever we're, you know, for example, if I was going to try to culture yeast from grapes, I would start with the grapes, maybe a little water added to it, mash them up, and then the, it'll either start fermenting or it won't. If it starts fermenting very quickly, you're going to be able to smell the alcohol. So what we'll do is we'll fortify that with sugar or another type of substrate and then let those yeast continually to produce alcohol. And then once you get yeast that are producing at, uh, you know, 16 plus percent ABV, if it ever reaches that, you know, there's an organism in there that, that was allowed it to do that. So at that point in time is when we go in there and start culturing. And then once we get those yeast into isolated cultures, uh, we'll then retest them to see if they can do that. So that's the way we would uh, approach that type of uh, question. A question from Eves Cons Constantino. Uh, any scope for use of Schizosaccharomyces in bourbon as in they do for rum? Well, I mean, you know, any yeast that has the potential to make alcohol has the potential to be used in uh, distilled spirits production or beer production or whatever. So, I mean, you know, the short answer to that would be yes. Schizosaccharomyces, uh, like Schizosaccharomyces pombi, for example, is one that's used a lot for genetic analysis. I don't know if it's because it's got a small genome or whatever, but 
you know, it is conceivable. And, and we've got a lot of different strains, Cloveromyces that I mentioned earlier, Pichia. There's a lot of different ones that have potential to make good distilled spirits or beer. And a lot of those are already used in, you know, uh, Lou mentioned Britannomyces earlier with some of the sour beer. You know, those are all have applications in making sour beers and those types of things as well, ciders and whatnot. Uh, you know, you have Robin Smith. Now, you were mentioned before you, you've, uh, you've tutored and you've uh, kind of mentored folks who are getting into the business. Uh, Robin Smith asks, uh, I'm a chemical engineer looking to dive into more detail as it pertains to fermentation for brewing and distilling. Do you have any uh, book, uh, books, resources, or yeast, or even general microbiology uh, that uh, you would recommend? Yeah, um, you know, it, all you got to do is put in Pat Heist Google email, and you'll probably get my email address, which is pheist at wildernesstrailky.com. If anybody's interested in any, um, you know, uh, articles, I, I've probably written, you know, 10 or 12 pretty good articles that sort of span all the different things relative to what we've been talking about today. I'd be happy to share those. You can go online and, I mean, I'm not the only author in that field, but you could certainly uh, search my name and fermentation. And, you know, I've written several articles that are probably right along the lines of what you're looking for. And anyone looking to get into the distilled spirits industry, you know, most of the big bourbon producers and the companies that own big uh, bourbon distilleries uh, or other distilled spirits, you know, they have job postings and different things on their website. So there's a lot of resources out there for people to get into this industry if you just know where to look. Um, I was just going to mention Annie Hill. Um, she's got some excellent uh, books for um, mythology. So that's one I would throw out there. What do you guys think of this book? This was something that uh, during my days at Diageo, they gave us. It was very expensive. I mean, for the time, I thought it was like 110 bucks at the time, which I thought was very expensive. You guys familiar with this at all? I've seen it. Is that a single author or is it multiple authors? Uh, it is it just says volume editor, so it must be yeah. multiple editor. Uh, Ing Russell. Ing Russell. I have that as a reference book in, yeah. the, in the collection. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've had, I've had two of them. One was given, and one I bought. Started reading it. Couldn't understand um, it. Made big words. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Steve Bayshore says, "Pat, we use firm solutions used at George Washington Distillery. Been very good for us." Yeah. Fred uh, Fred Swanson now with the uh, uh, Dancing Goat says, "Yeah, use that too." Yeah, oh yeah, they, those guys just built a monster Rick house up there. Yeah. Beautiful picture. If anyone uh, knows Fred on uh, Facebook, he posted a picture of it. Looks like you're down in Kentucky. It's big old, huge wow. brick house. Wow. Nice. Uh, you then uh, Graham Frazier uh, again says, is there any value in using wet rather mm -hmm. than dry yeast for fermentation? Yeah, I mean, you know, our company has always focused on active dried yeast because you don't have to refrigerate it. You don't have to ship it cold. You know, if, if the yeast spends a couple of days on a loading dock somewhere, if it's a, a liquid yeast or a wet cake yeast, you know, there's just spoilage concerns with that. They're also known to have more contaminating organisms in it. So we have always focused on active dried yeast. So... You know, for some like genetically modified yeast, it makes more sense to package those in liquid form. But firm solutions, we only do active dried. I know even from that perspective, there's I've seen some particular proprietary yeast strains that have a real trouble being dried into active dried yeast strains as well. So that That's would be right. a scenario where you would have to, you know, select the, the cream offering. That's right. Now, in, a, in your search for yeast, all right, whether you're searching intentionally or just discovering it, you, you deal with all these distilleries around the world. Have you ever come across a yeast that is really weird or bizarre? Or you say, oh, my God, I never saw this kind of yeast before. And then you're kind of afraid that it might unleash it on the world if you brought it back. Uh, I've never had any fear about that, but we've definitely right. come across a lot of different weird yeast strains. Again, Several of the strains that we have isolated 
they, they have yet to be characterized or even named. So that would be a pretty damn weird strain. Uh, so <laughs> they look really weird. You know, um, a couple of years ago, I, I noticed one under the microscope. It had three buds coming off of it. It looked like a little cat paw. So anytime the UK Wildcats are playing in the NCAA tournament, I always put that on my social media to remind people that <laughs> these are UK fans as well. <laughs> of course. Of course they are. You can, If you listen really closely, you can hear when there's a, uh, a touchdown. Oh, yeah, that's great. Um, Steve also commented, and the mullet is also known as the achy breaky mistakey. Achy breaky big mistakey. <laughs> I've heard that. Reference to Billy Ray Cyrus. And, Joe Dirt. I grew up around a bunch of Joe Dirts. Yeah. Outside. And those, those mullets, man. Yeah. Well, I was one of those. I didn't just grow up with them. I was one of them. <laughs> yeah, but it's a That's little different. There's only one way to go, but up. You, you grew up in Kentucky, right? Yep, I've Born lived in Brad? Kentucky my whole life. Yeah, I, it's on the south side of Chicago, southwest side of Chicago. Mullet just looked weird. It just wasn't right. Of course, that was coming from a clean-cut kid such as myself. The, uh, the Indiana State Fair is probably the closest. Uh, NASCAR, <laughs> NASCAR, when I was working for Crown Royal, as you did the uh, Crown Royal, I don't know if you went to the, any of the events, but NASCAR, that was mullet heaven if you're in the mullets. 80s and 90s around here, the mullet was how you reeled in the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> um, that is amazing. On that note, also uh, commented uh, the ZZ Top of Yeast. Yep. I've been called I've been called worse, but that's uh that's accurate. Well actually oh yeah, that's a flannel you're wearing. That's not uh camouflage, is it? Yeah, this is actually Patagonian. Oh well, I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah, back back off, man. <laughs> oh. Back off, he's a scientist. Show, you, a scientist. show your shirt again, Liz. Show your shirt again. <laughs> show your shirt. Your shirt again. Yeah. Back off, I'm a scientist. We'll get you under the spat. We got you. Uh, and then I guess one last question. Yeah, one last. You want to get that lizard? Sure. So a lot of words. One from Ralph. Uh, with WTD growing exponentially, obviously your contribution to Danville and the surrounding community and the economic client, there has to be tremendous. There has to be tremendous. Could you comment on your future plans for new warehouses? any in-house farming of grains, as well as prospects for further expansions and distilling, as well as guest experience enhancements. Need Everyone money. needs to make the pilgrimage to Danville. So I'll definitely um, fully agree with that last sentence there. Anybody who's interested in uh, bourbon or distilled spirits production, you know, definitely come see us. We're always ready to roll out the red carpet and tell you everything that we do here and, show you what we got going. But yeah, you know, um, you know, we've always been, we're what's called a Kentucky proud organization. So we focus on uh, buying things from Kentucky producers as much as possible and, you know, supporting the local economy. Um, as I mentioned, we buy almost all of our grains. They don't grow barley here in Kentucky, but most all of the rye, the corn, the wheat that we buy, which is over a million pounds a week, is uh, all purchased locally so you can imagine you know that alone has an enormous impact on the economy um the stillage that we generate even though we bitch about it all the time that's a hundred thousand gallons of free cow food that goes out the door every day so that's also you know a big thing not to mention the fact that you know we're making 990 million dollars retail value of bourbon here every year so you know all those things collectively we're on the bourbon trail. So, I mean, they're actually building hotels here to accommodate people. People are opening up new restaurants that are bourbon themed, Wow! Um, you know, to take advantage of the uh, people that are coming to Danville now. I mean, we had even last year before we were on the bourbon trail, we had 65,000 people that came here to tour. We have an event here uh, every year. It's the weekend after uh, Labor Day. It's called the Kentucky State Barbecue Festival. And it was canceled last year, but uh, in 2019, the last time we had it, there was over 42,000 people that came here oh to Wilderness Trail uh, over the course of two days. 
And, uh, you know, it's just amazing. The uh, And we do a lot of events around here to support the you know local Humane Society and Kiwanis and Rotary and, you know, about anything you can think of. We do a lot of, you know, American Cancer Society. Uh, we just did like a, a fuck cancer uh, bottle not too long ago. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that brought a lot of excitement uh, to, you know, anti-cancer uh, causes and things. So definitely, uh, you know, it has been a big thing for the community. And we're very proud to uh, be able to support those things. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. How many, bar how many uh, barrels do you have laying down right now, would you say, Pat? Um, on the campus here, we've probably got close to 150,000. Wow. Or so. I ain't been at all. No, no, nothing to sneeze at. Even it's if not too bad for a side project. If you wanted to dig in a little bit more about WTD and what they have going on, there's a link right below to their website. It's that green little rectangle there is for you to click and check out. Pat, it's been amazing having you on. Um, thank you so much. It's I think we had a lot of comments come through about um, how much they enjoyed the show today. So really appreciate your time and sharing your uh, knowledge with us today. So. Yeah, awesome. Well, I'd also like to, in closing, give a huge shout out to the, all the staff here. You know, a lot of times me and Shane get a lot of the credit. But, you know, we've got 50, 60 people that are working their butts off for Firm Solutions and Wilderness Trail. And we couldn't do it without all the, uh, you know, the great people that we have that uh, make up the team here. So just want to close out with that. Awesome. Yeah. Go, uh, go visit Wilderness uh, Trail Distillery. It's the yeast you could do. <laughs> oh, boy. Were you stewing on that one the whole session? <laughs> <laughs> Before we go, um, just wanted to tee up next week. So continuing the technical takeover theme for February, we're going to be talking about wood. So Andrew Weebrink um, from Independent Stave will be on next week. So there's a little link that Will posted. Um, so go ahead and sign yourself up. It's going to be a another a great, great hour and change. And uh, you, you, Pat, you cannot stop that guy talking. He's awesome. To thank you, um, uh, Lou is going to send you 200 copies of uh, signed copies of this book for nice. you, staff, <laughs> to hand out on the uh, the, the, stops. Road, the road in front of the distillery. And I'm selling in the gift shop. <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to send you a little special something from Scotland. I think you're going to enjoy. It just popped in my head. Nice. Talking, so. Mutton. Mutton. Yes. Haggis. haggis. Leftover haggis from uh, <laughs> the Bobby Burns nights. On that note, thanks everyone for joining Pat again. Cheers. Uh, and we'll see you all next week. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye, Thank you.